Gigabit Home NBN plans arrive, but why are they only available for some Australians? And is it inevitable that Telstra is going to end up owning the NBN? Vertical Hold is proudly brought to you by Aussie Broadband, changing the game with their award-winning network and Australian-based support. Hi there. Welcome to Vertical Hold Behind the Tech News, the weekly podcast where we catch up with Australia's leading technology journalists to get the stories behind the tech news of the week. I'm Alex Kidman, and I'm joined, as usual, by Adam Turner, a man who's frantically been spending this lockdown week brushing up on his Donkey Kong skills. How goes it, Mr. Turner? I've got my eye on the 30,000 barrier, but I dread to think when I break that what you're going to set next, where you're going to set the bar. Look, look, the secret is to not get hit in the head with the barrels. That's where you go wrong. Oh, you've got to go over the barrels. I've been trying to go under the barrels. All right, that explains a lot. That explains a lot. This week, we've got a new face in the virtual vertical hold studios, albeit at a socially distant level, as is wise. From ZDN at Australia, it's Chris Duckett. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you, gents. Pleasure to be here in the whole dome or whatever you call this place. It's like the Terra Dome, just a little less Terra. <laughs> We've had it polished recently, so it's 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 very shiny. And uh, speaking of shiny, Chris, ZD, it's a very shiny work-focused site. Um, what's the lockdown been like for you work-wise? Uh, well, we've actually... This is sort of the way we've operated for years. Um, with the office in Australia, it's sort of a bolt-on. Um, but this is kind of basically the dreariest, most lethal tech conference we've ever covered. I have to say my local cafe uh, co- my local cafe kept serving throughout the whole thing. So I had all the essentials for life. Um, but yeah, I recently finished some uh, post-grad study and I was really looking forward to actually having my weekends back and getting some travel in and catching up with people I'd neglected over the recent years and zero from a thousand on that front, I think. It's a very, very familiar story. And it's a big week in telco news with NBN set to make gigabit home NBN plans available, although practically not for everyone. And Telstra showing off new 5G gadget, while rumours continue to swirl that it'll be the front runner in any NBN co-sell-off plans. But first, let's get fast with gigabit broadband plans at last. Although gigabit broadband on the NBN, it's not exactly a new thing precisely, is it, Chris? No, if you were lucky enough to have a full fiber connection and you decided that that was what you were going to run your business off, you could get a gigabit, I think it was one gig and 400 up, I think, but it was very, very expensive. Um, and chances were there was, you'd probably go to any other provider if you had the choice. And I think we've also had a few weird little promotional consumer level things. I think it was Lawntel and Launceston had them for a bit. And I think when My Republic launched, they had a single town or something where they said, oh, you guys can get gigabit. But the numbers were always horrendously low across the entire NBN when those numbers got broken out. Yeah, there's a reason why we don't think of Wollongong as gig town, right? Because <laughs> there was how many? You know, 20, 30 maybe? The number that always sticks in my head was that uh, in the reporting, I think Telstra, the nation's biggest ISP, had one gigabit NBN ca- customer. Count them, one. Yeah, yeah. It's and a- hi, hi to Andy Penn if you're listening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice to know you haven't moved recently, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> so is your average punter likely to notice the difference between 100 or 250 and 1,000 if this is just a consumer plan and not a business plan? How many kids do you need to have before you need a 1,000 meg? Uh, Yeah, you probably need enough to fill a Tarago and have them all wanting 4K streams or something. Um, There's been a couple of reports recently from the uh, competition commissions either side of the Tasman that have basically poo-pooed the idea of these really, really high-speed tiers for people thinking that they're going to stream or even game faster. Um, That was the particular pullout from the New Zealand one they were saying you're not going to get a latent like a latency difference between their 100 meg plan and then their what they call an NZ Fiber Max, which is about 900. Um, but yeah, and then the ACCC turned around and and then they're like, well, we actually think probably about 100 is enough. Um, and you look, I, I, to be honest, I'm sitting here on a 50. You know, I 
sometimes think about a hundred. I never consider a thousand. Mm. See, I would consider a thousand. I would actually go for that. And um, I suppose to get the elephant out of the room, the ISP that said they're going to launch this first is Aussie Broadband. They happen to be the show sponsor. This has nothing to do with it because we do think it's a good newsworthy topic. But I'll be really keen to see where they offer it because there are some technology challenges in offering this. This isn't across the whole NBN, is it, Chris? No, this is just on fibre to the premise connections. And then the word that's doing the heavy lifting here, some HFC connections. Now I hate that word. <laughs> now I, I had the HFC pit about oh probably about seven meters from where I'm sitting right now, and I kind of just want to know if I can get a gig here for funsies. Because um, mm. yeah, full disclosure, I use Aussie Broadband as well. Um, that's just because I think they do good stuff. Because and they put up CVC graphs. Love their CVC mm. graphs. Um, but yeah, part of me is because I. I I probably have one of the shortest lead-ins of a HFC place you know, ever. So if I can't do it, that should give an idea of how many uh, premises in the footprint cannot do it. Do we have any idea of what would distinguish between some and some not? Because it's all it's not like some are on the old Optus cable because they ditched that because we all knew yeah. it was crap. So everybody's on former Telstra HFC. Is it likely to be the line to your house or is it more likely to be what's happening at the exchange or what they've got running to your boy? What's likely to be the, well, the hold up there? That's the thing is that, I mean, they'll probably just do a line test and see what it comes back and go, yeah, yes, no on that. Which sort of, that's what they do with 100 and 250 plans right now. Uh, yeah. But you do raise the other thing, which is the uh, shared medium on HFC. And if, mm. if you're in a block of students and everybody's got a gig, well, good luck probably cracking 300, yeah. I think. You don't want the bastard next door to get a gig plan. You want to get a gig plan. Yeah, you want to go around and sabotage some routers so that you get <laughs> what you pay for. I have some extremely elderly neighbours who I don't think are interested in gig connections, so I'm hoping I'm right. But I wonder if it's not like with their fibre to the premises deals where it also had to do with the CVC that they were provisioning at a particular point of interconnect as well. And I guess we'll find out on Friday. All of this, though, is predicated on NBN offering these new price constructs as well. Chris, do you think that other ISPs are just on Friday going to say, hey, we do this too, or are they going to wait and see what happens to Aussie on this one? I wouldn't be surprised with either, quite frankly. Aussie, Aussie can do it because they're, you know, small player in a position that, you know, if 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 it all t- turns to crap, then you know, nothing lost. Uh, whereas, you know, the likes of Telstra, Telstra won't even give you what is it? I think it's about a hundred meg now on a copper connection, like flat out just refuses they, to what, do they, it. Yeah, they they won't provision a one hundred connection if you're far better than node. That's exactly right. Yeah, mm. so we're probably not going to see, you know, Telstra stick its neck out. Um, so we probably will see the smaller players go first and, you know, of the majors, you'd probably most likely to see TPG go first, I think. Well, TPG and, not, and it's menagerie of brands. I see. I would argue against that because I think the reason why someone like Aussie's gone first is because they tend to attract the kind of customers who are there because they care about quality and performance. So Aussie's customers more than your average customer is likely to want a thousand megabits per second. Now, TPG, I think a lot of people would agree has gone downhill in the last couple of years and be, has become a bit of an also ran. And I don't think if you're after cutting edge performance, TPG is just not at the top of your list. And the same with Telstra and Optus. They're more aimed at ripping off, uh, you know, mums and dads than they are at delivering great customer service. So I think that it'll be, the specialist ones who are trying to win people over is it, I think is it My Republic or something like that is another one who really prides themselves on their quality. They will be the ones Ooh. that will do well out of this. Yeah, well, I look at the ACCC um, monitoring reports and um, while they're basically pointing out, you know, oh, you don't need high speeds to watch Netflix, the one brand that is trailing on every measure is My Republic. Oh, okay. They did come in talking a big game, but they don't seem to have delivered on no. it. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They landed, splashed a gig around. Everybody's like, "Cool, this is <laughs> this is what we need." Um, yeah. yeah, didn't land on their feet, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, like my Republic has been dropped from a couple of categories in the quarterly survey because they just don't have the customer numbers. So that should probably tell you enough about how they're going. Yeah, um, it's a shame about Internode. Internode yeah, well, back that, in the day. That's what I was g- going to get to with the TPG <laughs> yeah. stuff. Is yeah. inside that big TPG brand, there are 
still those sub brands that people still have some mild warm feelings for and yeah, yeah. main one being internode so maybe of course they could launch it through internode only but not tpg because that that tpg story has always been one of we're really affordable and these are not the most affordable plans are they chris no this is going to set you back about a hundred and a half so around about 150 i mean that's i mean we're talking about plans that two weeks ago were going to cost you multiple hundreds of dollars like that enterprise plan we talked about before is you know many hundreds of dollars so it's not it's not actually too bad in the grand of scheme of things just as long as you don't compare it to other countries um <laughs> if you compare it to itself it's that not goes bad. with just australia broadband in general yeah, doesn't it <laughs> exactly yeah do not look at those new zealand prices okay you will lose it you will just cry yeah, yeah. you will just cry and don't compare it to singapore because you know it's an island state and you know there's a bunch of caveats with that but yeah it, in australian broadband terms we've been ripped off more for less in the past I was actually just thinking that because I used to pay close to that on a Telstra cable connection yeah, all it, up, including speed boosts. And it's part of the reason why I'm almost tempted, to, if I can get it, to just go, you know what, I've paid that before, I'll pay it again, and I'll get a much better product as a result, or potentially a much better product. Potentially, because mm. when this when this whole uh, wholesale pricing first came out, S- Simon Hackett, the Internode founder, yeah. basically laughed at the 1000 slash 50 plan because he's like, the 50 up, will barely cope putting out enough sync uh, acknowledgement and sync packets on the connection. So he's like, you're not going to get a thousand down on this thing. Um, and there still is that thousand four hundred thing sitting in the back of all these ISPs catalogs. So if you actually want actual upload speeds, you go for that one. The thousand fifty really is a. I really, really just want to watch a lot of Netflix. Fifty up is is. I mean, this is this is one of those horrible assumption things. Fifty up is probably enough for most consumers, he said, and in twenty years that quote will probably haunt me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But if you want to be more reasonable, there are, there's higher upload speeds on two on two fifty plans. In which case, I would suggest for most people, if you're going to do a sizable amount of uploading, like podcasts or something like that, that that's probably more the one something that, legitimate. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Everything's legitimate in Russia. Um, yes. You know, that's more the plan you would go for than this, you know, what MBN's calling the ultra fast uh, plan, because, you know, as long with new pricing, we get new names for everything. Mm. It's weirdly positioned pricing, though, because I've been looking at it. It's 150 bucks a month for this 1050 plan, or the uh, their 250 100 plan is 210. So it's a quarter of the speed down, but twice the speed up for 60 bucks more and i start to think about that and then my brain starts to fall over especially because that's the actual tier that they're advertising their evening speeds on because even they don't know yeah well no one's offered this before so it actually it it actually makes sense to go with well you know you don't want to guess at these things because rod sims from the a triple c will come a calling if you get it wrong You'll get Sim smashed. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah, he he gets green and he goes to the federal court and you, you just don't yeah. want to see it. Um, Has to buy himself a new shirt. It's ugly. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I I have a massive beef with the ACCC because they run their tests at layer seven and MBN is responsible for a layer two connection. And the ABC, um, the ACCC has a cry because, well, our layer seven tests are never going to match what's on the box. And it's like, you're opening a box of apples and saying, where are my pears? Like, it just doesn't work that way. Um, so I'm not surprised that the ISPs are treading very carefully around this. Now, that's an interesting point because in the the fine print, what the, the in response to what the ACCC has been saying about those speeds, the MBN is provisioning an extra 15% capacity to connections to allow for that overhead that you lose. Yeah. But they're not adding it to this 1,000 megabit per second plan. Do you think that that extra 15% will make a difference to the plans that do have it? And do you think it should have been applied to the 1,000 or is the whole thing a joke? The whole thing's a joke. Uh, Let's compare it to New Zealand. But surely more is good. No, more is good. But in New Zealand, they have, they call it fiber max. It's essentially what gigabit plans. But when they sell it, the retailers sell it as a 900 megabit plan. That way, if they get over the number, it's all gravy, right? 
MBN has said on this one that they reckon they can get sort of, I think it was, I think they said they'll only lose about uh, 10 or 15 megabits per second in what they dub framing overhead. But for networking people, it's TCP IP headers. Like this is the Mm. stuff that makes everything run, right? Like you you got this everywhere. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if in a couple couple of years we see a retailer putting on the side of a bus that their 50 megabit per second plan can give you 60 megabits per second with this extra overhead they've got. Wouldn't the ACCC not allow them to advertise it that way because they've cracked down on telcos before for doing dodgy stuff like that? But if you're an ISP that can actually buy the bandwidth and you've got this overhead in the back pocket, people on the side of the bus don't need to know that the 60 megabit plan's running on a 50 megabit connection or supposedly 50 megabit connection, because it's actually not going to be that anymore. It's going to be 57.5 or something, you know? Yeah. And this extra 15% CVC, is that a permanent thing? That's not just a COVID short-term fix, is it? No, that, yeah, that is forever. Um, Yeah. The short-term COVID fix is the 40% extra that got gobbled up. Uh, The ACCC released a report on Tuesday and they had 40% CVC growth when that boost was turned on for a week. Mm. Um, now, one of the reasons why we love the Aussie broadband CVC graphs is we can actually see the capacity they're buying and deploying. And I've kept an eye on that since the lockdown started. And Aussie was uh, growing their CVC well into April. And I expect that they're not the only ISP that behaved in that fashion. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, for those who are playing at home, what that means is they're actually making sure they're spending extra to buy the capacity that people need to get what they actually paid for. In summary, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's the short, short, short version. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can't say it too much clearer than that. We might actually get what we pay for on the box if you don't look at what's inside the box. That's just crazy talk. Crazy talk, I tell you. I know. I know. Who'd have thought networking stack was relevant to a broadband network? So, Chris, this week, Telstra sent me what I can really only describe as a brick. And whilst there's certain people at Telstra who probably would send a brick my way, possibly at high velocity, in this case, it's a sort of interesting 5G brick. What's this all about? So, Telstra is really getting out in front of where its network is. So, these bricks, which are 5G hotspots, uh, well, I guess they double as bricks and 5G hotspots, but... This one has functionality for millimeter wave. Now, millimeter wave is stuff that runs in the 26 gigahertz spectrum. It's the stuff that your aunt Karen on Facebook is losing her mind about at the moment. Um, Hail the lizard queen. I just saw her leaving with a can of kerosene (laughs) to take out the local tower. Yeah, this the the millimeter wave stuff is why people are burning down 5G towers. Um, It's unbelievably stupid. Chris, I hate to correct you there. People are burning down 5G towers because they're idiots. Yes. Yeah, well, that's true. The that's fear true. of millimetre wave might, might play into it, but, uh, yeah. but yeah. it's really dumb. It's really, yeah. really dumb. Yeah, it's incredibly. But what is also incredibly dumb is that Telstra is sending these things out when they have three sites in Australia capable of using the thing to its fullest potential. There are two on the Gold Coast and one somewhere in Sydney, probably somewhere out near Parramatta. Um Telstra so, doesn't like you talking about where it's secret labs that we all know where they are. are. Yeah. But yes, yeah, yeah. somewhere in that vicinity. Yeah. Um, and so I got the brick. I've tested the brick. The brick gave me 120 down, not a, giga, not a gigabit. Um, this was similar to when we were testing Telstra's 5G network when they first switched it on, and you could sometimes get multiple hundreds of gigabits in certain parts of Glebe and around there, but you couldn't get it standing out front of Telstra's office. Um, Just under the Harbour Bridge is actually, well, well, was ah, actually quite good. And there's the a nice bridge acts as a huge there's antenna, a, does it? Prop, quite possibly, but there's a nice little <laughs> park down there that a bunch of us did testing, but I know what you mean. I have not, because 5G is nowhere near me, I've not yet been able to do 5G testing on this thing. Yeah, I'm just on the edge. I think I'm on the edge. Uh, I went to look at Telstra's 5G coverage map yesterday and, a login form to their back end popped up. Um, so, but they fixed that. Um, but I'm just on the edge of the network, and 
the hotspot does jump between 4G and 5G all the time. So getting a lock on this dang thing in lockdown is, yeah, not it's, it's not really a thing. Um, you know, when I actually had a weekend, you know, more of a weekend yes, uh, last weekend, I was actually in a cafe that had one of the Optus 5G, you know, their big uh, pyramid modem things they've got. Mm. Yeah, I said, oh, so how was it? <laughs> Doesn't go through walls. Yeah, well, that's pretty much... <laughs> That's pretty much, you and, know, high speed five G for you. So he was actually sort of like, uh, you know, so he doesn't have to put anything in the wall, but he wouldn't wreck up, you know, he would. He's not um, crowing from the rooftops about it, that's for sure. And I think it's the same thing with this hotspot. It's an interesting one though, because it's not actually a first five G hotspot either. When they launched five G, they had an HTC produced hotspot. This one's through ZTE, and so far, without having tested the five G. I think I like it a little bit less simply because this is this is almost your classic hotspot. It does a hotspot and that's it. The HTC was essentially an Android phone without the calling bits. Because that's what you need in your life is an extra phone. <laughs> well, okay, sure. But if I'm paying the kind of money that you have to pay for this thing yeah. and, and the, the new one, 600 bucks for what yep. it's worth. If I'm paying that kind of money, I may as well have something with a screen that I can run other things, even just that you could speed test to check what your network conditions were like because the only way you can do that with this is via another device. And if you're doing that over Wi-Fi, you're going to get a packet loss anyway just because you've got that extra layer of, of, of Wi-Fi there as well. Yeah, it's an interesting sort of thing you point to. And it, it sort of goes back to the Aussie stuff, which was uh, that uh, I, I forgot about, which was, you know, Aussie said you need, you should probably hook this thing up to a Google Nest, right? Because the basic routers they send out can't keep up. Um, mm. And Telstra with this one is like, oh, the hotspot's got Wi-Fi 6 in it, um, which is fine, but probably don't walk up to it with a four or five-year-old laptop or phone and expect to get the sort of speeds that the theoretically should get. Yeah, you'll need something fairly new. In fact, I think there's probably more phones out there now with Wi-Fi six on them than, yeah. than laptops. I mean, that'll that'll get better. And I suppose there is that that future proofing angle in all of this. Once they actually, well, once they actually own some millimeter wave spectrum for a start, yeah, because they yeah, don't even com- own the spectrum they're using. No, you're buying a device in 2020 for 2021 at least. It's I don't know where I don't know on whose balance sheet that works. It works on Telstra's, but I'm not sure about anybody else. Well, speaking of balance sheets, the other big story around Telstra this week is, of course, this suggestion, and it, it's been there for a long, long while, that uh, it might end up being the company that buys NBN Co. And we had the communications minister actually fairly much kind of openly saying, "Oh." Yeah, Telstra could buy it, I guess. So we might like after saying for a long time, no, they can't. No, they can't. No, they can't. Yeah, maybe they can. What's your take uh, on this, Chris? Okay, in summary, in the current legal framework, they can't. So it would at yes. least require a, a law change. Um, you know, that could be snuck through in the dead of night, etc., etc., etc. But um, we expect to see some jumping up and down if they did. Um, I don't think Infraco owned as part of Telstra or even if it's an indirect subsidiary or anything, I don't think anybody's going to allow that to happen because at its heart, the MBN exists as a way to route around Telstra. Um, Yes. You know, we got caught up for years talking about the technology in this thing. And as it's shown itself now, and from the word go, it was always an economic solution to a problem of having a massive integrated behemoth telco that sat on infrastructure for decades. And abused its power a lot. Yes. Um, You know, Telstra did go to the government a number of times and say, we'll we'll build a fiber to the node network for you if we can charge whatever we want on it for for a decade or two. Yeah, and hold the country to ransom. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, even, even for the Howard government, that was a couple of bridges too far, so it never got anywhere. But the idea that after doing all this and spending $53 billion that we're going to let it go back to Telstra, um, that is just nonsense. The way it could work, though, is if Telstra actually spun out Infraco in a proper way, not not in a we still own it way, as in Infraco is now over there. Maybe they've got – I can't remember the, in the NBN legislation – 
I think it stops comp- uh, existing providers having like double digit stakes. It might even be 5%. You know, they might have a very, very, very minor stake in it, but it has to basically be its own thing. And then suddenly we would have a fully separated wholesale network in this country that we've been fighting for for about 30 years, ever ever since uh, ever since that fabled time back in the 80s when they decided to put Telecom Australia and OTC together into mm. one thing because that was better. But Telstra's proven in the past that they can't be trusted to do them, this themselves. They theoretically put a line between their, their retail arm and their wholesale arm and because they were wholesales to all of their competitors, and they totally abused that. Now, I can't remember what the term for I think it's structural separation yeah. is when you're actually two different companies, but then there's another one that's like a, a virtual, yeah, we'll just pretend that we're Funch- separated. Functional separation. Functional yeah. separation. Telstra has proven again and again they cannot be trusted to do that, haven't they? Yeah, and there's a bigger thing to this, which is what happens, because both sides of the political spectrum have said we're going to privatize NBN at some point. Yeah. Um, now, even even though Fletcher's sort of nodding and winking at Andy Penn at the moment, even Fletcher still says that this potential privatization is still a long way down the road. When we get to that point, whoever is in charge of this thing, what what sort of incentive is there for them to upgrade the network rather than just sit on it like Telstra did? Um, mm. Like we've even seen, so Australia does have a very good mobile um, you know, broadband uh, sector. It's very competitive. They, you know, this is the part where we actually do top like open signal surveys and that sort of thing. But it's got to the point now where the government has had to do uh, five rounds of the mobile black spot campaign because there are just parts of this country where it's uneconomical to roll out infrastructure. And so when it does eventually get privatized, who is going to sit there and go, well, we could roll out actual proper fiber to this regional town, but it's only 300 people. Why would we do that? So, yeah, there's there's a big discussion in with a lot of the things happening around the world at the moment about you know government getting back into uh, economics and that sort of stuff. And MBN, you can make I think you can make a really good argument that selling this thing off will just basically freeze in place whatever state the network is in at that point. Well, it's an interesting question because I was going to throw on my my devil's advocate hat and try and work out if there were benefits to the NBN, to the way the NBN runs in Telstra ownership. And the big one that springs to mind is one of the things Telstra does with its NBN, which is that whole 4G fallback. There's not a lot of debate that, especially regionally, Telstra's network outperforms those of its competitors wouldn't having that sitting on the back end of the nbn and being able to say right this applies to every nbn plan so people should not drop off the network except in the most extreme circumstances be a good thing let me bring out another devil to meet your devil and say that nbn has spectrum holdings why shouldn't they run their own mobile network Mm. because towers cost money to build I suppose is the argument built, against that. They've built yeah, well they've built the towers in regional Australia and they could lease off uh met, metro ones. I mean, you know, there are ways, you know, when MBM was conceived, they did, you know, they put in for very good reason this fixed line split, this wireless split. But yeah, as we see now, um and even overnight, um some of Telstra's enterprise customers are now getting 4G fall fallback on their, you know, gigabit business plans. Now, I don't think you want to run an office through an LTE connection, but it might be good enough so that your sysadmins can actually try and fix some stuff while the building's falling down around them. Keep the bad keep yeah. the bad guys out, but not necessarily get anything done. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're being hacked. Switch to LTE. That'll fix them. <laughs> <laughs> That'll slow them down. <laughs> but also, Telstra offers that 4G fallback as a competitive advantage. Okay, I won't go with Vodafone. I won't go with Optus. I won't go with anyone else. I'll go with Telstra because well, I'll get the 4G. Bad. Vodafone, oh, they do the same no, thing. Okay, sorry, you're right. Yeah. Sorry, Vodafone. <laughs> I didn't think that through. All right. Okay, so I'll go with Telstra. I won't go with Optus because Telstra has the 4G fallback. So Telstra offers it to try and win people over but if Telstra run the NBN what would be the advantage of giving it to everybody they wouldn't care They'd, they don't care if everyone drops off so if I'm they Telstra, just want to all right, stand out I'll take because this is my devil I'll take this one on, on the chin <laughs> yeah. if I'm Telstra I spin it 
as the reason why I should be allowed to buy the NBN because oh, everyone okay, can have sense. this, you see. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there's just this coincidental thing that people suddenly think, oh, that Telstra network's all right. Maybe I'll put my mobile and everything else with them. Maybe I'll get my NBN through them anyway because then it's all what Like I could see a, a, an argument yeah. in that direction. I don't necessarily agree with it, to be clear, but I could see it happening. Yeah. No, there's or a- Telstra could just offer decent 4G fallback wholesale to all its competitors, but heaven forbid. <laughs> oh! <laughs> laughed and laughed and Didn't laughed. You laughed. should see Almost the size of the unicorn out the size of my window at the moment. <laughs> it is rainbowing everywhere. Second class, of course. Yeah, but <laughs> besides the fact that that would absolutely take MBN out of its layer to remit. Hmm. Yeah. The, the counter argument is, well, what happens if the MBN ends up in the hands of, say, a Bain Capital? Mm. Because who's got the money to purchase something the size of MBN? A lot of private equity. Yeah. Maybe the Ottawa Teachers Fund, if we're lucky. But <laughs> but can we trust them? What are they going to do with it? Oh, they I would aid, imagine sp- well, split it all Canadian- up, let the copper rot and, and, yeah. and run yeah. a fiber well, the premises network. Yeah. The Canadians are nice, so at least they'd smile as they did it. But... Um, you know, b- besides having some sort of superannuation fund in Australia, Congress to agree to all invest in the NBN, I just can't see this thing when it's sold off ending in a place that we would find nice, for lack of a better term. Well, that once again wraps up another episode of Vertical Hold. Thanks to Chris for joining us for the show this week. No problem, gents. I'm looking forward to riding this unicorn down the street afterwards. <laughs> Remember to put a saddle on that thing. And if people want to catch you, aside from riding unicorns dangerously down the street in a non-socially distancing way, if they wanted to find you riding online, where can they do that? Uh, Go to zdnet.com.au. Anywhere else is probably just a dog in a costume. (laughs) And if they want to find you on social media, they will find you at... At Dobes, but I'm not going to spell it because that's a dog in a costume. (laughs) And if people want to catch up with us, you can do that on Twitter at Vertical Hold AU or via the Vertical Hold Facebook page. And as always, thanks everyone for listening again. Hope you're staying home. Hope you're staying safe and we'll catch up with you again soon. Vertical Hold is proudly brought to you by Aussie Broadband changing the game with their award-winning network and Australian-based support.